Good morning, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another cool, different type of show here on Friday morning at the Fun House with Martin Popoff. Today is all about albums that were upstaged by their album covers. So think about it a little bit. So you went out, you bought this album based on a really cool album cover. Maybe you knew the band well, maybe you didn't. And then you put the album on, you're like, hmm. I think I like that album cover a little bit better than I actually like the music, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so Martin and I have gone into our collections and pulled out stuff that we actually, that's exactly what happened. And uh, we might be able to get a couple episodes out of this, so bear with us. But uh, yeah, we're going to, we're each going to talk about 10 here today, show you the album cover, talk a little bit about why we feel the album cover is better than the music. And, uh, you know, we'll see what we come up with here. So All I'll right. let uh, Mr. Popoff go first here this morning. All right. So my first choice is here, let me take the uh cover out of the cd thing this one right here thunder train from boston with mock bell on vocals um i picked this one out because this is one where um this was uh, i have fond memories because this is one of the family trips from rural bc where we all piled into the camper van with the family four of us ingeniously built camper van that slept for and we'd stay at hotels or in the camper van blah 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 right across the country we did that twice we went to mexico um uh once doing this as well but i remember buying this Boston band in Boston, which is a big deal when you're from uh, across the country. And uh, it looked super heavy, um, you know, Thunder Train. And it was called, uh, what was it called? Teenage Suicide is the name of the album. That's what the band looked like. Um, so I thought, oh, this is going to be a rip roaring album. It's a white vinyl. And uh, it's kind of like uh, Bad New York Dolls. It's kind of like just rock and rollsy, really dated for 1977. It's a 77 album. And uh, as a bit of a twofer, I picked out this one as well because I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it as a whole entry. But this Tough Darts album was the exact same sort of thing. It looks like a crazy punk rock album with this guy with the glasses and the gold teeth and the smoke on the back like this, these guys looked heavy and it was like a New York band. And this might've been bought regionally as well. I might've bought this in New York city on the same trip, but I'm, I'm not positive about that, but these two together um, kind of go to show how, um, you know, you think something's going to be heavy or rock, you know, or, or punk or something like that. And it's just kind of like uh, a step up from the dolls or Tom Petty. Like it's a little, you know, that East coast rock and roll thing. I mean, it, you know, there wasn't a lot of metal really out of the, out of the East coast at that time, hard rock at that time. And, and, and these things kind of proved, you know, CBGBs and, you know, you had dictators and stuff like that, but those two, yeah, I thought they would be heavier and uh, I think they might've been bought on the same trip and they're not that heavy. There you go. It happens. Uh, that, that's always the uh, the kind of dicey situation when you're buying a band you've never heard of before, right? But we used to do that all the time. You buy, you bought it from the album cover. It's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Yeah. Speaking of winning and losing. So I figured, you know, with this guy, I was a big fan of this guy. And uh, this album came out. I remember seeing it. I, I believe I bought this in the import rack at uh, Record World in Middletown, New York, back when it was first released. And I, I was like, well, I love this guy. He's one of my favorite guitar players. Uh, and this album cover looked amazing. I'm talking about, let me take it out of the, uh, take it out of the CD jewel pack here. If I can get it out, there we go. Uh, Built to Destroy from the Michael Schenker group. Mm. I mean, okay. what's not to like, right? Gorgeous uh, model, right? You got the fancy yeah. sports car. Michael is smashing his flying V on the back window. It's like, oh, this is going to be rip roaring guitar fest with Shanker and company. You know, you got the guys on the back looking all kinds of cool, whatever. And then I remember putting the uh, the album on, and I was like, wait a second, this is definitely not like assault attack right <laughs> yeah. this is definitely not even like yeah. the first two because you know gary barden's back in the band because and at the time i don't even know because unless you were reading like kerrang or metal hammer magazine you didn't even know that that uh, graham bonnet was no longer in the band so all of a sudden this thing shows up and here you got barden back in the band again but it's this is it's like this is the first of all the production is not great and it's not a heavy album at all yeah. And there's not even a, you know, this is not a big guitar album. Uh, and for a young kid who was, you know, Schenker was like God to so many of us back in the day, uh, you know, Rock My Nights Away, yeah, kind of a cool song, but it's like, I mean, all of a sudden Schenker and company are starting to sound like a lot of these commercial, uh, you know, pop metal bands or hair metal bands, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, you know, 
too many ballads, not enough guitar histrionics. And with that can't miss album cover, I was like, hmm, yeah, this is a miss. And, you know, all these years later, going back to it, it's not a terrible album, but when I think of like a lot of my favorite Schenker albums, it doesn't even come close to the top. And I still think this cover is very cool, but the album is just not as cool. Yeah. Maybe because he smashed his guitar. That's why it's not a guitar album because he had no guitars left. Right. Yeah, that could be right. And yeah, and I remember like looking at that, like, Oh no, how could you smash that gorgeous, gorgeous Gibson flying V guitar, yeah, man? Yeah. Come on. It's like, don't do that. I mean, I know you yeah. got some money, Michael, and you can probably afford to, but uh, man, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Good choice. Good choice. Um, I get accused in the comments of, of not saying the album when I, when I hold it up. So I, for, so for the record, I want to say my last one was thunder train teenage suicide. And I held up the tough darts just in yeah, case. We all, we all do. Yeah. I'm going to try. Remember. So my next choice is angel white hot. There you go. Yeah. So angel white hot. So here we go with a, with an album cover where the band is like being kind of like burned at the stake. I uh, can't show you the back because this is all framed up, but there's like the burning Paris. Paris has been, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's a big riot going on. It's being destroyed. Uh, the album's called White Hot. It looks like a, kind of a Kiss album that they're, they're maybe moving into that Kiss zone more. And lo and behold, it was a step down again where there's actually not a single heavy metal song on this. I mean, Angel had some great heavy metal earlier on, especially on the first two records, then kind of half and half on the next one on Earth it is, as it is in heaven. Um, but they called this one White Hot, which would uh, suggest it was going to be pretty heavy. And it's actually uh, quite, quite mellow, as I say, but it's got you know it's got the it's got the fire and the white and the browns and the reds and it and it and it looks like a pretty incendiary uh, happening but it's uh but it's actually very tame so there you go second choice yeah that album cover and i love the artwork and that album cover just screams we're we're coming into the big time yeah and i totally don't think the music lived up to it yeah especially after those first two albums i mean come on <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> All right. All right. Let me, let me take this out so we can get a better look at it. So this is the last studio album. So I'm going for something pretty recent here from legendary prog band. Yes. Fly from here. I mean, Roger Dean, spectacular artwork here. Gotta love it. I mean, Roger never disappoints and you know, maybe I should have known better, but uh, seeing as uh, my kind of distaste for the more recent yes uh, albums in, you know, the last decade or two, but I saw this album cover and I was like, all right, that's, that looks like yes, trying to return to form. Roger's just doing some spectacular work here. And once again, uh, the music just does not live up to the album cover at all. Produced by uh, Trevor Horn. Everybody remembers sang for the band uh, on the drama album. And this is once again, other than the pretty cool title track um, suite, it's just more of the same kind of limp, not really proggy, recent yes material. Um, I, I don't know. It, it just, to me, this band seems like they've been going through the motions for the last couple of albums. And I really wanted to love this because I mean, I, again, it looks like a classic yes album from the seventies and the music is just anything but, and I, yeah. I, I remember being so disappointed with this. And again, I should have known better because the previous couple of albums let me feel in the same way. So, uh, you know, it's like once bitten, twice shy, but I'm not paying attention. But uh, yeah, so yeah. Fly From Here, love the album cover. Music just leaves me flat. Yeah. All right. I'm not as low as you are on, on recent. Yes. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hating as much, but what a great album cover. I mean, Roger Dean just gets better and better all the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So my next choice is uh, Nazareth with two excess. Um, you know, Nazareth's probably got a few that might fall in this category, but you know, it's a, it's a pretty mellow album. Um, you know, they're trying all these different pop things. Um, it, this kind of happened all through the eighties with them, but you know, you look at this big, massive two excess. So it means, you know, you, you'd think, you know, they're going to rock out two excess, right? Although Pete, it's funny, you know, he says, uh, you know, it, Everybody was confused by the title. They thought two times five, what's going on here, right? So nobody knew what was going on, but so you get this massive two XS on fire and on the back, it's like burnt up, kind of like uh, except Restless and Wild with the flying V, right? Yep. Um, 
but yeah, look at that, you know, great logo, you know, the logo looks really cool up there. And this, this looks like it's going to be a rock and rock and Nazareth album. And it's, it's just one of their experimental, you know, tasteful albums of the, of the eighties kind of thing. So it's, it's definitely not too excess. If there's anything too excess on it, it's uh, it's the production uh, tricks and tricks and things from the eighties or whatever that are, that are done to excess, but yeah, there you go. Nazareth. Yeah, I remember buying that off the rack back in the day, and I was a big fan of the band. And that, yeah, that totally looked like a big, heavy album, you know, all the fire and all that kind of stuff. And putting that on, I'm like, there's like, there's like one heavy song on the entire album. And I was like, what is all this yeah. acoustic stuff? And it's like, oh, this yeah. sucks. Yeah, that um, unfortunately, that kind of started a trend for the band that uh, continued through much of that decade. Yeah. All right. So, Martin, the reason why I didn't share my list with you beforehand is because I had a couple surprises here that I thought would okay. make you laugh. And uh, this one especially, this is the, like the right. first one I thought about in doing this. So if you go back in time, um, when this band, when this band was really huge in the in the mid late 70s and they decided that they were going to all of them release solo albums. And I remember the artwork on these solo albums were pretty incredible. And I remember this particular guy was my favorite guy in the band. And I remember going to the store and buying, I was like, oh, he looks amazing on this cover painting. He looks just awesome, highlighting in green and everything like that. I'm talking about Peter Chris's hey, solo right. album and thinking <laughs> Peter looks the best ever. This is just amazing. And then yeah. dropping this on the turntable and like, <laughs> what the hell is this nonsense? Yeah. Uh, and granted, you know, we of course know now that uh, Peter put this album out because this is the kind of stuff he's into. He's into that whole kind of R&B, soulful, funky type stuff and just good time 70s, you know, 60s and 70s pop rock. But, you know, when you're a, what year was this, 78, 77 when these came out? I mean, I'm, you know, like 10, 11 years old, kisses everything to me and I love Peter Chris, and this was just absolutely unlistenable and thinking how disappointed I was, you know, how you get these great album covers. I mean, every one of them in this whole series were fantastic. And, and you know, Jeans is disappointing. This is a, a mess. The other two were really good, actually. But uh, yeah, love the cover. Love it. But man, the music does not live up to it at all. Not even yeah. close. That might be the, the best choice in this entire show for a yeah. great album cover yeah some, absolutely yeah yeah top top to bottom right the the gulf between them and peter always looks cool in those old old pictures from that era right remember the american revolution one with the uh the flag and oh yeah and and the and the um the christmas one with the snow and all that like he always looked really cool right it was yeah. great makeup and everything so yeah yeah too bad and, you know it's funny because i don't know if you caught it but we did a um a dream setless show on kiss i don't know about a week and a half ago or something like that Gu guitar hack was on the show with me and jack toledano and in my dream set list I, I was doing the dynasty tour and i wanted to do one solo track from each of the solo albums for a little segment of the show i struggled what, what song do you pick from this album right there's nothing heavy on here i, I yeah, wound yeah. up taking one of the covers i was like oh my yeah. god it's like I, I just was almost like you know we're just gonna skip the peter song but i was like well i created the yeah. scenario i gotta throw one in there so yeah yeah funny <laughs> all right okay my next choice is um this one right here thin lizzy nightlife um probably uh possibly their heaviest looking album cover actually um you know it's it's got the city with a, almost looks like a nuclear thing happened in the background or or sunset at least so you've got the orange and the yellow you've got the great logo um you know jim fitzpatrick you got a you know a, a panther on the cover overlooking the city i always thought this part down here looked a little bit like a flying v hey eh? see that yeah, it does yeah it the, does. the yellow part eh? um but um yeah, not a very heavy album. This is where they were still kind of, it's a little bit like Vagabonds, although we are into new lineup. Even the band looks pretty rocking on the back, yeah. right? You know, get the leather jacket on Brian there. I mean, they look they look pretty heavy here, but uh, but it's it's a fair bit of kind of mellow stuff and some R&B things on it. Um, what's nice and heavy on here? Shalala, of course, is pretty heavy. Um, uh, it's only money, but, uh, but no, pr pretty mellow. I mean, mellower than, uh, mellower than jailbreak, which yeah, it's pretty, pretty heavy looking cover, I suppose as well. But, um, you know, Johnny, the Fox isn't a heavy looking cover. Renegade isn't a heavy looking cover. Chinatown's pretty heavy, but, but this one looks like they, they really mean business and it's, uh, it's not, it's not a hard rocket album. So there you go. 
Yeah, I would say that album cover ranks right up there with Thunder and Lightning is the, the striking album cover. You're like, oh, this is going to be a can't miss, you know, yeah. hard rock affair. And that one, yeah. I, I like that album. But yeah, it's definitely it's definitely fairly mellow considering, you know, you got the two new guys on guitar on that album. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Kind of expecting a little more, although that sound is permeating a lot of those songs. But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a good choice. All right, so uh, my next one, we're going to go to the late 80s here. Uh, Judas Priest puts out uh, Ram It Down. Mm. I mean, <laughs> great choice. Yeah. Pretty, pretty cool <laughs> album cover, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. You expect this to be an all out uh, metal assault. And, you know, for a lot of people who didn't like Turbo uh, that came out before it, um, you know, we were all hoping this was a step in the right direction. And granted, there are a couple of decent tracks on here, title track especially, but, you know, we got that abomination, Johnny, be good. Uh, you know, I mean, cliche song titles and choruses all around. I'm a rocker, love you to death. I mean, monster of rock. I mean, this is just like, I don't know, to me, uh, the band were just really kind of struggling to uh, get through the decade. And I think they figured it out again on Painkiller. But I, yeah, this just looked like a can't miss album cover. And yeah. Uh, yeah. it's not one of my favorite Priest albums, not even close. Uh, but, you know, not awful, but when you've had, you know, before it, those great album covers and great albums with Defenders of the Faith and, you know, Screaming for Vengeance and all the 70s stuff. And then you see this, you kind of expect something, right? And you don't quite get it here. So Yeah. And, and actually, you know, I've, I've never really thought about it. I mean, it's perfect for this show because that probably is the heaviest looking album cover already to date, right? I mean, to there and then Painkiller, but everything before that, you had some fairly heavy looking album covers, but that is probably the heaviest looking one, right? It's violent, yeah. right? It's called Ram It Down. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah. And you know what? And looking back on it, you know, based on what we see here on the cover and the title, wouldn't this have be, been better off called like Crushing the World or something like that? Yeah. But then yeah. again, if it was called Crushing the World, then it's even more of a letdown, right? Because there's nothing really crushing on here. Yeah. Other than yeah. Like a track or two, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so my next one is The Gods. Nothing is sacred. I mean, talk about a heavy album cover. Look at yeah. this. You got these these four badass bikers coming out of the smoke on their on their bikes. Um, you know, great, you know, rock and violent logo. It's called Nothing is Sacred. They all got their sunglasses on. Look at them on the back here, right? Yeah. Yeah, just a classic band shot. And it's actually a, a fair bit mellower than they debut, which is this one, just the gods, which you know, it looks fairly heavy, but it's not crazy heavy, right? And then you've got the illustration of them on the back, but but it, it's quite a step down. Again, uh, almost like my earlier themed one with Thunder Train. This is this is kind of like rock and rollsy, poppy, kind of Brownsville station, um, maybe a little Grand Funk to it. Uh, maybe not Grand Funk, but yeah, it reminds me of heavy Brownsville station almost a little bit. Like they're going, they're going kind of retro on it but they really turned it up for the album cover. So this was definitely a disappointment at the time as you, as you flip through it in the record racks and see that, you know, new God's album. Wow, look at that. So there you go. Nothing is sacred. I mean, how many of us really wanted the gods to be quite heavy? And they really, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I like them, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I think, yeah, you have this expectation of what that band should sound like and they're just not that at all, which, yeah, yeah what are you gonna do? Yeah. There's a lot of bands that fall into that category, I think um all right so uh my next one is another meh, more recent you know this is within the last uh, five six years or so um dream theater is the astonishing hmm. i mean uh that's a pretty can't miss futuristic looking album cover you know we knew when this came out that uh, this was going to be a double album concept album and for dream theater fans like okay wow another concept from the band we're all in, right? Uh, I even went and bought this shirt when I saw them live because I love the album cover so much, but I just do not like this album. Yeah. I love Dream Theater. They've been one of my favorite bands since the start of the 90s. And I can honestly say I like all their albums quite a bit. This is the only album in their catalog I do not like. I've tried so hard to get into this. Like I said, I went to see them live on this tour because they were going to play the whole thing. And I figured, well, maybe maybe the album's going to finally click with me seeing it live. I was bored to tears. Before I left the arena, though, I was like, all right, I am going to get a shirt because I love the album cover and I'll proudly wear it. But hopefully nobody asks me what I think of the album because I hate to, I hate to be negative about stuff. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, this is just a, a long, boring, not catchy 
not engaging album at all and it came across the same way live which was really weird i mean uh, they just they plowed through the entire thing they didn't talk to the audience at all and man it was just and i'm all for playing you know full albums and things like that i don't have an issue with that um but this this just does not click with me at all but i love the album cover it's it's, it's actually one of my favorite album covers from them but yeah the music is not yeah. cool yeah i mean most of their album covers are pretty amazing right yeah. um but they might be feeling a little dated as time goes on too. Like, cause they're also CGI ish, right. Yeah. Yeah. As well. So yeah. All right. Um, my next choice is, uh, this one right here, Alice Cooper, easy action. Yeah, good one. Look at that. Look how heavy these guys look. They, they're, they're so heavy. They don't even want to look at you. They're so heavy. Right. And then on the back there, they are just looking like a, you know, complete badass rock and roll band. Um, the album's called easy action. It's got, you know, the red and, and, you know, the, 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 the cool logo. So it kind of looks pretty no nonsense. They look pretty rocking on the inside. But of course, this and Pretties for You are the two that are kind of like um, dated psych rock, kind of Zappa-esque, kind of silly in a way before they kind of rediscovered their sound. And then they had some amazing album covers. You know, frankly, later on, their album covers were still heavier than the music, right? But yeah. um, but at this point, their album cover was heavier than the music and, uh, and definitely better than the music as well. Uh, you know, the Prettiest For You album cover is notoriously bad. It's a pretty crappy album cover. But, uh, but this one, yeah, I mean, just look at that long hair and stuff. You, you, you oh, look yeah. at this and you think you're getting a, a super heavy album, but uh, you're definitely not. There you go. Easy yeah, action. they definitely looked cool as hell. And uh, yeah. Yeah, you think of the back of Killer or, uh, or yeah, the back of uh, Love It To Death. Um, yeah, they, they were just one of the, one of the scariest looking bands going. Oh yeah. yeah. And the makeup helped too, of course, on Alice. Right. Yeah. They took like the, the Rolling Stones look to another level. I yeah. think. <laughs> All right. So, uh, journey trial by fire. Mm. So, you know, this was, this album was a big deal here. You had the reunion of the, the classic, you know, lineup of the band, and uh, got a lot of attention, had a hit single that uh, did pretty, pretty big business. And, uh, you know, when you love a woman, but great album cover. I mean, just whatever it's supposed to be. You got all these, you know, interesting things. You got a giant baby in a ship. You got like a sexy looking island woman with a cat head. You've got uh, a couple people floating in the clouds. You got a kind of planet in the background. I mean, all sorts of cool stuff going on here. Pretty interesting, but uh, the music is not really that interesting. Uh, probably my least favorite Journey album, uh, filled with way too many ballads and just bland songs, you know, a couple decent tracks. But again, as we saw quite a bit in the early days of CDs, you know, way too long, way too many songs, most of them pretty forgettable. And uh, the band quickly like kind of splintered once again right after this they made it's like they made their money with this didn't bother to tour and then before you know it's steve i mean you could just tell by the back cover steve perry looks so disinterested he's looking the opposite direction of the rest of the band he can't even smile i mean right there what does that tell you that these guys are probably just doing this for the money and that's exactly what kind of happens yeah but, uh, but I, I still love the album cover i think it's great journey has a lot of really great album covers but uh that album unfortunately leaves me pretty flat totally upset yeah with the illustration, that album cover, you know, leads leads you back to the golden era, but it also looks quite proggy, right? So it looks like they would yeah. they were bringing up some of the stuff from the prog era, and it was going to be super creative and all that, right? Yeah. So yeah. yeah. All right, my next choice, um, Diamond Head Borrowed Time. Um, you know, this album was uh, a little bit casual. Um, didn't have a lot of songs. It redid some stuff from the debut. Uh, you know, great. The gatefold looks super kind of sumptuous and expensive as well, right? Um, so yeah, it had a gatefold. It had a poster of uh, of this as well. This great Rodney Matthews album art, and especially contrasted with the debut, which was you know a much better album and just like a like a plain white white uh cover on it and then you know different covers for re reissue this is a this is a clear clear choice where it looks like way more work was put into the album cover than was put into the album this this kind of spelled the beginning for the end for them i mean i like some of the stuff on here um especially i would say um borrow time the title track 
Uh, but to heaven and hell, not not a great song. Call me's kind of poppy, but they redid Lightning to the Nations and they redid Am I Evil, and it only has seven tracks on it. Mm -hmm. So everybody was scratching their head when this came out. It's like, well, look how much money MCA just spent on you, and you turn this in, right? These these seven songs, not a great recording. It sounds just as sort of demoish as the debut does, uh, but demoish in almost a worse way. Um, so it was just kind of kind of a uh, definitely. It, it felt like a phoned in album uh, with their most sumptuous album art that they would you know ever do. Essentially, yeah. I mean, I, I'm guilty. I saw that sitting in the import section back in the early '80s, and I was like, I gotta have that. I mean, I don't know anything about this band gotta have it that's a fantastic album cover and i was I, I mean i do like that album but i was left thinking yeah this is not the music does not portray what you see on the album cover at all it doesn't quite live up to it not quite good choice all right um jethro tell rock island hmm. yeah i mean this you, you look at this title rock island Obviously, you got the porthole of a ship here in the water is this little island, which is actually a, you know, a hand coming out of the coming out of the island there with the flutes. You're thinking, all right, this is Jethro Tull getting back to proggy, heavy business, what have you, uh, after the very successful Crest of the Nave, which they actually inexplicably won a Grammy for best hard rock and heavy metal album, whatever, it's a story for another day. Uh, but after like, kind of like uh, Kissin' Willie, which is kind of rocking and pretty silly, uh, not a lot of really good songs on here. It's like most, I, I don't dislike this album, but I think that, uh, you know, when you see this, this is a, this is, you know, and this is a band that doesn't have a lot of great album covers. Unfortunately, they have a lot of really bad album covers, but I think this is kind of cool. Again, it's kind of like a digital ish looking sort of, but I, I kind of like the, the logo up there. I, I, I just love this. I, I, I love the whole thing with the flute in the water, but most of the tracks on here are kind of forgettable. Uh, it's like the band is trying to go between like kind of doing some catchy heavy rockers, not a lot of prog on here, a little bit of the blues rock that they would start to experiment with a little bit more on their next album. But, uh, you know, for a lot of people, it's kind of forgettable. And one of the worst albums of theirs of the 80s. Uh, you know, I don't think it's their worst album of the 80s. It's a little uninspired, I think. And uh, yeah, I definitely like the album cover, I think, more than the album as a whole. I don't hate it, but it's a good choice for this episode. I think. Yeah. And it looks pretty retro. It looks like it could be a seventies album cover. Yeah. So you're thinking that as well. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, my next choice, generation X, Billy Idol. Um, you know, there's a few of these, these punk albums that you think are going to be raging rock and awesome, heavy punk. This was not that at all. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of retro and poppy, just not very good. I mean, Billy actually got better and heavier after generation X, but that, that makes no sense, right? You're thinking it, you're in the middle of the punk thing. He's part of a band. It's called generation X. This is supposed to rock and it doesn't. And there are, there were a few like this. I, uh, Blondie almost strikes me a little bit that way. They've got one or two album covers, I think, at the beginning where you think, ah, this is probably a pretty cool rock and punk band. And they were they were not. They were never very punky at all. And so I'm always constantly disappointed when I when I try those Blondie albums every once in a while, never like them. And And this is just you know, politely people just don't talk about this record very much because they, they just were not that, that, that punky sounding. Uh, it was just kind of like weak tea music. And, and so it made a lot of sense when he went on to the solo career and did amazing at it. Right. He, he turned into a huge star, but uh, yeah. And then, uh, then there's the, the other, the other one, I, theirs looks really, really kind of heavy and punky too, but, uh, but yeah, you, you don't look much more rocking than that. That almost looks like a, like a dead boys album. Like, that it could be that heavy but screams um, attitude man it's just yeah like, screams attitude and there is no attitude on it there you go generation x all right speaking about screaming something and the music just doesn't really scream a hell of a lot of anything uh emerson lincoln palmer in the hot seat oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i mean you know here you got this uh and i'll take it out of the uh out of the jewel case but uh here you've got this 
ELP train. You know, it's got the, got the freight train there with the big gold front and everything, the logo on there. And coming down the tracks, going to run over a old style wooden chair, whatever, whatever that means. I'm not really sure what the symbolism is there. But, you know, you see this and you're like, OK, ELP is back. The Rampage and Runaway train, we're going to get a, a pretty aggressive crazy prog album from these guys in the 90s right as they're moving into the new decade and man what a limp album this is i mean just uninteresting to the max filled with too many ballads not enough crazy keyboards from emerson uh i i can't tell you how disappointed i was when this came out of course i, I had to go and rebuy it on cd and all that but you know whatever uh, <laughs> just yeah. just because but yeah i mean and, and their other album the album that came before this um, which was their their reunion album is actually quite good. This is not though. It just it sounds completely uninspired. They sound old and tired. Uh, you know, Greg Lake's still singing good on here, but man, it's just you know not enough crazy synthesizer stuff. Hammond organ from Keith. A lot of very piano ballady, just middle of the road kind of like pop rock music, and not very not very prog rock at all. Uh, very disappointing. They look really cool on the back, but uh, yeah, this is not a very cool album, unfortunately. Yeah. And years earlier, if you were a metalhead and picked up brain salad surgery and thought, oh, my God, this is going to be the heaviest thing of all time, you'd, you would have been in for a shock, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But at least that's a cool album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Um, my next choice, um, you know, I'm going to go with this one next because my, my last choice, I'm going to leave a really good one for last choice that really has a strong feeling about it. But so here's a, here's a cool, obscure one. Um, White Snake Stage Fright. Um, this band, I'm, did I say White Snake? Witch Find, sorry. <laughs> Witch Find Snake Fright. Uh, stage Fright. Witch Find Stage Fright. There we go. Um, their debut album, Give Them Hell, had this album cover on it. And even this one kind of feels a little bit like that because for an album cover like that and for a back cover like that, I mean, this is almost looks heavier than Venom, but it's yeah. it's not. They have a they have a little bit of a retro melodic poppy sound uh, to them, but this is actually a pretty heavy album, and it, it's a good solid new wave of British heavy metal album. But they follow it up with Stage Fright, which uh, which looks really kind of classy and even scarier, uh, and it's it's a textured uh, cover. And uh, it's actually mellower than the debut, believe it or not. And when, when they should be getting heavier because the new wave of British heavy metal is getting more dialed in and heavier as well. I mean, it's got two of the great new wave of British heavy metal songs of all time on it. The title track, Stage Fright and Wake Up Screaming. But the rest of it, um, you know, like would not be seen dead in heaven, right? Not, not even that heavy a song. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you, the, the names of the guys, Montalo, Steve Bridges, Pete Thud, Sergi, and Grass Scoresby, right? You know, this is supposed to really rock. Look at this back cover, right? Eh? <clears throat> right in the middle of it, Spotlight, Stage Fright. You know, this, this, when I got this, I thought for sure this is going to be way better than the debut, and it was actually mellower than the debut. So there you go. Not White Snake, but Witch Find, Fine. Stage Fright. There That's you a good go. Choice. Yeah, those two album covers scream all sorts of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> okay, my next choice, uh, another pretty big band who had a, uh, a split and decided to come back in together in the 90s with the classic lineup for the most part. Uh, Sticks, Brave New World. You got this awesome Johannes album cover. You know, I remember seeing this and thinking, all right, we got Dennis and Tommy and James getting back together again after being apart for a little while. Maybe they put their problems aside. The album cover takes you back to the like the glorious like uh, Grand Illusion album cover, right? It's very cool. You got all this cool imagery on here and whatnot, and, you know, typical Johannes uh, Splendor on there. And uh, you look at the track list and like, all right, we got a lot of songs on here and uh not a lot of really good ones. There's probably a handful of decent ones on here. Title track, Brave New World is really good. <clears throat> Number one is decent. Uh, Fallen Angel, everything's cool. The more you listen to this album, I was just playing it again this morning before we taped, and uh, Heavy Water is a good rock and JY tune. But it's, it's almost like, you know, now that we know the history of what Sticks went through all throughout those years, you listen to this, and it sounds like a bunch of guys who probably were not even in the studio together putting together an album. You can tell all the Dennis DeYoung stuff sounds nothing like everything else. Tommy's do, into doing this really kind of um, 
you know, anthemic type of rock stuff. You got JY doing the heavier stuff. There's really not a lot of proggy anything on here. Dennis's stuff sounds like kind of Broadway play type of, you know, big and bombastic type of stuff. And now you know why this band split up originally and why this they've had so many issues, those three working together, because they're not on the same page on here at all. Granted, some decent songs on here, but, uh, you know, you take a look at the, the wonderful artwork on the outside and you're thinking, all right, Styx is back big and bombastic and you know anthemic and all that kind of stuff and eh, not a very good one it's okay not yeah and the artwork just like the journey like says it, it says prog to you a little bit right with the with yeah. the illustration illustration does that right so yeah. prog says metal i mean illust not in this case it says metal but illustration often says metal right yeah yeah so yeah Cool. All right. My last choice is a perfect choice for this because this literally happened that way where, where, you know, I bought this album and, um, and was disappointed. I bought it. The, uh, the cover art was amazing. And then I was disappointed and it goes back to the old school. Of course, we're talking about billion dollar babies, battle axe. Look yeah. at that. Yeah. So uh, when did we ever see that happen uh, uh, before where you named a band, uh, a band after your great album, heaven and hell did it right. Um, but here we've got uh, the Alice Cooper group without Alice forming a band called Billion Dollar Babies, which is an awesome band name. And then they called the album Battle Axe and it had this big robotic guy that looks like he's made out of like uh, like jewels or, or you know, what, rubies, uh, you know, with a with, you know, wielding a big guitar with an axe on it. Um, there's the band on the back. The band on the back, you're thinking, oh, maybe this isn't quite that heavy, but it's five guys with long hair. So I remember picking this up and looking at it and saying, yeah, this has got to rock. It's the Alice Cooper guys without Alice. You know, you're, you're having some sort of fantasy that, well, Alice is not that heavy really anymore. So maybe these guys just wanted to rock out and be super heavy. No, it's not very heavy at all. It's kind of like not well recorded. It's poppy. It's a little bit here nor there. Um, it's a little bit like Poppy Alice Cooper, or Poppy Lou Reed. The names of the songs, Too Young, Shine Your Love, I Miss You, Wasn't I the One, Love is Rather Blind, Rock and Roll Radio, Dance With Me, Rock Me Slowly, Egomania, Battle Axe, and Winner. I mean, I, I we probably knew because we were so dialed in at that point just by reading those song titles when we got this home. It no way this is going to be good, right? Yeah. No, yeah. No way. Even though, even though, yeah, it's, it's like, well, who would he, we got, we got three of the Alice Cooper guys, Michael Bruce, Dennis Dunaway and Neil Smith, plus Bob Dolan and Mike Marconi, who was a, a stand-in guitarist for Glenn, I think at, at one point. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, engineered by Lee DiCarlo, just a, a, a pretty weak album. They tried to go out on tour with this album. They had a big elaborate show with the, with the whole battle axe thing going. It cost them a ton of money. No one was showing up to the shows and they had to knock it on its head. I wrote a big story about it in one of my old out of print books where I did these like one essay things, but yeah, what a gorgeous album cover, right? So cool. And and you can't beat Billion Dollar Babies as a band name and Battle Axe as an album title. There you go. You have to wonder, I've thought about this many times because, yeah, that album is a big disappointment. You have to wonder if Glenn Buxton was in any kind of shape to participate in that project that the album might have sounded a little different. Yeah, yeah, true. Because yeah. it's missing a lot of his big riffs and, and stuff. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they could have been poised with that. And with it being 19, you know, 77, I think it's 77 on this, right? Um, yeah, 77. Uh, if, if they would have turned in like a draw the line rocks, Derringer, Sweet Evil, Cat Scratch Fever kind of album, you know, they, they could have possibly even upstaged Alice had they had they made a rip roaring record, right? Yep. Yeah. And it's kind of the album is kind of missing that front man. You know, the vocals are okay. They're not great. Yeah. 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 All right, my final choice for today, uh, another one of those uh, kind of longstanding bands that had some really great album covers back in the day, which is the reason why I ever got into this band in the first place is because I saw one of those great album covers in, this, in the uh, record store and I just fell in love with them from there. Then they, they broke up for a number of years and then all of a sudden you see in the store as well, Electric Light Orchestra is back. Zoom. I mean, come on. This look at this can't miss album cover, right? It's like it's just like the day where I first saw Out of the Blue. 
in the uh, in my local record shop. And I was like, I love spaceships and futuristic stuff. It was a double album. I was like, sure, I'll take a chance on it. I loved it. And all those other ELO albums from back in the day and pick this up. And all of a sudden, I, you know, and I go to look and I'm like, OK, we got Jeff Lynn here and Jeff Lynn. And, and not a lot of other people, right? This is uh, this is kind of not the EL Electric Light Orchestra that I remember. And uh, it's basically, it's not terrible. It's basically a Jeff Lynn kind of solo album using the ELO or Electric Light Orchestra name. It's very poppy. Not that their music wasn't poppy in the past, but uh, I'm missing all those big synthesizers and keyboards and the violins and cellos and all that kind of stuff. And this is basically uh, Electric Light Orchestra for, you know, kind of like the 2000s and, and what have you for, for the modern era. Uh, not terrible. Not an album I go back to hardly at all. I know there's some people who really love this album a lot. And like I said, I don't hate it. But I fell in love with that album cover instantly, and I've never been in love with the album. Not even close. Not yeah. even close. I would like to, but yeah, yeah, great album cover. They had a, they had a ton of great album covers that yeah. all that are just like like those Boston and Billion Dollar Babies album cover looks, right? Yeah. Journey for that matter, right? Yeah, it's just really nice, yummy looking, colorful illustration. So yeah, I cool. mean. Discovery and Out of the Blue and New World Record, even uh, you know, Face the Music with the electric chair on the front. I mean, how cool is all that stuff? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And this one, I, I love this one. I was thinking, all right, and even the spaceship, you know, it's not as colorful as uh, like the the early spaceships. A little looks a little bit more modern, a little more grays and things like that. But still, it's it's the yellow spaceship. I was like, all right, cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're right. They they really should have put a little more color into that. Eh? It's almost yeah, distracting, it's, eh? Yeah, and I think they, uh, they've uh, t taken care of that in the last couple because they put out two others since then. And those are definitely more like the older style. But yeah, this yeah. is a little dark. But, you know, you got the cool, you know, logo yeah. in the middle, which is pretty neat. You got a little bit of blue here and, you know, the yeah. blue ball down here or whatever. But yeah, they've they've improved on that on the more recent ones. But yeah, and again, even the more recent ones I like, uh, but it's still not not classic yeah. yellow to me. I, I Jeff Lynn. Jeff Lynn rattling around on that spaceship all by himself. All right? by himself, basically. Yeah, it's just like, you know, I, got, I can create this whole sound by myself. I don't need the six yeah. band members or seven band members, whatever. But there, there was a charm about that old ELO uh, sound and that oh, yeah. with, you know, all those string players and the all those keyboards and synthesizers and, you know, Bev Bevan's thunderous drums. And I think I really missed that the most, I think. There was something about ELO's music, even though we're not talking heavy music here, but when you had Bev Bevan crashing around on the drums behind all of it, uh, just really added something. And uh, yeah. I'm just missing that. But, you know, Jeff Lynne, a genius, great songwriter, great vocalist. I mean, I love him. But um, to me, ELO is all about the electric light orchestra. And to me, one man is not an orchestra. So I'm, I'm really kind of missing that from these albums. But uh, hey, at least he's trying to get the spirit of the 70s albums in the album covers. But, uh, you know, the music, not quite the same. Cool. Wicked. All yeah. right. So there, there you have it, everybody. So uh, 10 albums upstaged by the cover art. Uh, we can probably squeeze another episode out of this. So uh, stay tuned for that. I have some I didn't use for this episode. And I know Martin yeah. has as well. So, uh, so if you dig this, let us know. We'll definitely do another one. And uh, curious to hear some of your choices below on album covers that are pretty damn cool. And maybe you don't think the album itself is quite that cool. It doesn't quite live up to the album covers. So uh, I want to thank Martin for coming on today. Once again, on this Friday morning, you got a new book and you want to talk about, correct? Uh, yeah. So this uh, this came in yesterday around noon um, and I'm going crazy with it. So it's the new new Rush book driven. It's about a hundred hundred pages more than the previous one. There they all are with the, the spines going. So that's the whole trilogy. I got them out of order there, but Anthem first, then Line Light, then Driven. So yeah, that's at my website, martinpopoff.com and I'm packing them up and sending them out uh, right now. There you go. Martin, does that book go all the way to kind of to the end? Do you include? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's why it's so long, too. It's called uh, Rush in the 90s and in the end in, in quote marks because of the song title. Right. So that takes us right up to the end. And that's that's it. Hopefully that's the end of the Rush books for me. Yeah. Well, well some good ones there. So uh, you've done a nice job on these. I'm looking oh, forward to thanks. reading that. So awesome. There you have it, everybody. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Coming up today, uh, you're going to get another uh, Dream Setless show today as we finish up the month of March. We've only got a few left, so stay tuned for that. 
Uh, Lynn Versace is coming on the show also later today, so stay tuned for that. She and I are going to be uh, doing a top 10 song show on Jefferson Starship, so stay tuned for that. We got Butch Jones coming up over the next couple days. Butch and I, of course, because I know I mentioned everybody's asking about it, we're going to give Dream Setlist for Thin Lizzy, part two of our favorite guitar riff show, and uh, we got course hudson valley square is coming up monday night in the prog seat on tuesday really cool show uh talking about our favorite guitar players of prog jazz fusion prog metal and so on and so forth so uh, a lot of good stuff happening here and of course we'll see martin next week as well too so uh for martin popoff i am pete pardo have a good weekend everybody